Uh, for those of you that were watching the little uh, intro, I think that was on Rumble. Uh, shout out to Salty Cracker. Thank you for the, uh, this is the re-cup. Uh, there we go. Check it out. Uh, so uh, that was fun talking to him. Today will be no exception. James Corbett joins me uh, and then Jordan Schachtel. Uh, James Corbett is an award-winning investigative journalist. He founded the Corbett Report in 2007, a news and information outlet from an independent perspective, which uh, these days is highly valued and welcomed. He has lectured on geopolitics and journalism in uh, institutes throughout the world I'm looking at here. I don't even pronounce some of these institutions. Uh, and we'll get into that with James, including uh, a deep dive on Gelman amnesia. If you've never heard of that, we have a tendency to believe the media, and that is a terrible mistake. And when Jordan comes in in about 45 minutes or so, we'll visit what happened today in the House Subcommittee on Coronavirus when, uh, I think it was yesterday, actually, when um, Dr. Fauci appeared uh, as a witness. Be with you after this. Our laws, as it pertains to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Well, most of my career, I've been urging people to kick habits, change habits. Well, this time, I'd like to suggest getting into the habit of adding Paleo Valley grass-fed bone broth protein to your daily nutrition regimen. Here's CEO Autumn Smith. It's made from cows with 100% grass-fed and finished, and bones. They're bones. Rather than the hide, most bone broth or collagen powders are made from hides or hooves, but ours is actually made from the bone because it'll contain additional nutrients. Bone broth is a way to bring back those nutrients, those minerals, and there's glucosaminoglycans, and then there's collagen, which helps us prevent wrinkles and joint pain and actually heals our gut. There's, there's gelatin and there's just all of these ingredients that the modern diet has kind of left by the wayside. Susan and I have been mixing the chocolate favor bone broth literally into our coffee every morning for months. And we've noticed a difference in our energy, appearance of our hair, skin, nails. Susan's particularly very happy with this. The bioavailable protein also helps us feel satiated. That's the part I'm happy with. Paleo Valley bone broth also comes in vanilla and pure unflavored and can easily be added to your coffee, smoothies, yogurt. Go to drdrew.com slash paleo, P-A-L-E-O, for 15% off your first order. Again, that is drdrew.com slash paleo. Whoops, welcome. I want to just review the schedule coming up for uh, this and next week, if we could, before we welcome our guests. I want to get to him very quickly, though. Also, there we go. Rob Schneider is going to fill in for Roseanne tomorrow. Paul Alexander comes in. Peter McCullough next week. Z Van Fleet. Uh, Dowd. We got a lot, a lot of very interesting guests coming. So um, stay with us. Uh, and our crack producer that books these great guests, uh, Emily Barsh, just notified us that Rumble apparently is in the crosshairs of the regulators. Of course. Could, could it be otherwise? All right. Let's welcome our guests. We're going to talk about Gelman Amnesia. James Corbett, award-winning investigative journalist. The Corbett Report, C-O-R-B-E-T-T, report.com is where you can get his materials. Uh, um, James, welcome to the program. He's actually calling us or visiting us from Japan, which we really appreciate the effort. So it is roughly 8 a.m. Japan time. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks for having me. So first tell me, before we get into the specific topic, how did you get into this role of independent journalist? And did you ever imagine that that function would have such tremendous value in a world where people cannot find reliable sources on anything? Uh, to answer the question succinctly, no, I never in my mind, wildest <laughs> imagination um, thought that I would ever end up here doing this, talking to you on a platform like this. It's so bizarre to me. Um, but I guess we're all a product of the age that we grow up in, and I'm no exception of that. So my story really starts around 2006, where I was a I was an English major. I uh, got my 
bachelor's degree in English, and then I jetted off to uh, Ireland for a year to get my master's degree in Anglo-Irish literature. What do you do with a degree like that? Well, I always said, I'm going to frame it because I couldn't think of anything better to do with it. Um, other than that, what what are you going to do? Are you going to be a journalist or a teacher? Because could, that was generally you could, what you could read. Uh, you could read uh, Sir Gawain. So you could read Sir Gawain <laughs> in the Green Knight and Beowulf in the Gaelic tongue, which I, which I have tremendous <laughs> tremendous uh, yeah, demand for. Actually, I never quite got into that. Um, I was more of a Joycean <laughs> myself. But uh, at any rate, ah. um, I, yeah. So I ended up in Japan, just basically killing a year, seeing another part of the world, and earning enough money to pay off my student loan debt and. Lo and behold, I stumbled down the internet rabbit hole, which was um, coming around at that time, specifically these incredible new platforms like YouTube. Do you remember 2006 mm -hmm. Time Person of the Year? You and me and everyone else. Mm -hmm. You are the person of the year because of YouTube. And oh, wow, this new, this new media platform is coming along and it's going to completely upend the world. And I, I kind of scoffed. I, I rolled my eyes a little bit, but actually I started down the internet rabbit hole myself, finding all sorts of information that, hey, I never learned that in my history books, but I can go to the mm. National Security Archives and I can actually look at the actual document of Operation Northwoods. Mm -hmm. What? The U.S. government was the Joint Chiefs of Staff signed off on a plan to commit terror attacks in the United States, potentially killing Americans in order to justify war on Cuba? That's crazy conspiracy hog. Oh, there's the actual document from Lyman Lemnitzer himself addressed to Robert McNamara, and I can go read it for myself. So in that experience, <laughs> I suddenly found everything was topsy-turvy, up was down, and what, what is going on? And just it being 2006 at that time, I thought, well, I got to do something. So I thought, OK, it's the Internet age. I'm going to start a website. And a website became a podcast, <laughs> and podcasts became videos, and videos became articles, and articles became interviews, and suddenly I'm a media personality of sorts at any rate i've been doing this what 16 17 years now and uh yeah i never ever would have imagined I'd we have here. a lot of you have a lot of fans we're, we, we were getting a lot of traction on social media with people talking about the quality of the work you do which i, I think is a that's a that's a great testimony to what you're doing so i, I my next question is something i've been trying to understand i mean you it's easy descriptively to understand what is happening but I, I sort of need some sort of, I'm not emotionally satisfied with these descriptive um, historical uh, observations about what happened to journalism. What happened to journalists? Do, do they not, are they deluded? Do they not understand what's happening to them? Or do they, are they so uh, overcome with a new calling that they abandon all the previous or there's is there a consensus of ethics that is something anathema to anything i understood about journalism what what happened there's a lot of ways you can approach that question one of which is to just to look at the the professionalization of journalism by which i mean the uh the the rise of journalism schools and postgraduate programs and what have you as a way of training sort of upper, uh, uh, if not upper class, at least certainly well to do um, uh, young people are going through these sort of journalism graduate schools and programs and what have you in order to become journalists now, which was not a thing, say, half a century, a century ago, when it tended to be more of a working class profession with working class sensibilities, I think. And the closer you mm -hmm, get to mm -hmm. establishment, um, uh, uh, regime politics, the more you're going to play along with them and play into them and not want to rock the boat fundamentally. So the fundamental idea of journalism as truth to power, I think, has been subverted simply by the, the, the mollification of the journalist class, essentially, and uh, picking mm -hmm. uh, uh, people from um, higher economic strata, I think, in order to do this this job in, it, in and of itself. But that, that actually speaks to the bigger question of the big, broad sweep of history and the technologies that enable journalism and the types of mm -hmm. social relations that they bring about. If people really want to deep dive into that, I did a, a documentary a couple of years ago called The Media Matrix, where I looked at the development of mass media from the time of Gutenberg up until the present and into the future with the metaverse and what have you. And I think we have to understand the media paradigm as people think of it today, although it is definitely shifting, but we still tend to think of it from that 
dinosaur media paradigm of the 20th century, which came about specifically because you had all of these incredibly capital intensive technologies for getting information out. Printing presses became well beyond the means of the average person. You had to be uh, either a, a media baron who inherited millions and billions from your, your parents, like a, a Hearst or who have you, um, or you had to be a, a conglomerate. And then it, once you had radio stations and then television stations and satellite networks, there's no way an individual could possibly start up their own mom and pop media outlet. So it became this industry and the industrialization of the media itself obviously reflects on the types of journalism that would be done within that system. And I, I think speaks to that professionalization of the journalist class. So there's a lot of reasons that it, I think yeah. you've seen this change go on. But fundamentally, what has happened in the yeah. last 20 years has been truly a revolution. And I think a revolution on the scale of the Gutenberg revolution, which utterly changed the course of human history. We are living through that right mm. now. And not enough people really appreciate that. Wow. Uh, yeah, I've always, I've been saying for quite some time, I, I think about the film industry and it, I, th I think of it just as a technology that came around and several people learned to master the technology and then giant businesses were framed around it. And I, you know, it would it required an entire movie studio to do what I'm holding in my hand. I have an iPhone in my hand and you, I, I have the power to be complete movie studio in my hand. Uh, and that, that has got to make a difference. And so that, and I, I wrote a book called The Mirror Effect, and one of the things we chronicled in that book was some of the dismantling of the editor editorial, is not even the right word anymore, of the news delivery, I guess we'd say, or, or acquisition and delivery throughout the world that these these television stations and newspapers had had offices all over the place. And as it became more cheap to just report celebrity news, uh, they started just reporting celebrity news. And, and they got better ratings. They got, oh, there's the book. They got better ratings. They got uh, more traction. And uh, that was the end of uh, sort of on the spot real news. But, you know, to be fair, I mean, there's so much going on with citizen journalists right now anyway that, that you can sort of get your, and who knows, you know, you get a lot of information without needing an office or a, a, a what do they call it? A, a, you call one this an, an outlet for a, a, a news agency in another city or another country. The Oh, shoot. What's the word I'm looking for, guys? So uh, you got foreign con correspondent. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, but the... the no, the office. They, I can't even think of the name because they don't have them anymore. Bureau. What are you talking uh, about? What, what bureau. bureau? A bureau out in another in another city. Or Sorry, another. I was I was on Rumble. I got you. So let's get into this the specific topic at hand, which is Gelman amnesia. Uh, I'll let you describe what it is. Uh, I I I not only let me just also uh, add my sort of frame on it a little bit, which is not only do you read about topics you understand and know and realize how poorly they are reported nothing is more astonishing than when somebody uh prints or t tells some some reports something about you yourself because it's never close to reality so tell everyone about gelman amnesia all right, so this term comes from Michael Crichton. Yes, Jurassic Park, ER, Michael Crichton, um, who was delivering a speech back in 2002 in California at a leadership forum. And he coined this term, and he explained it as saying, okay, look, it works like this. You open the newspaper to an article about a subject you know well, and uh, it could be about, if you're a physicist, it's about physics. In Michael Crichton's case, it's about show business. You read the article, and you see the journalist has absolutely no understanding of either the facts or the issues. Often the article is so wrong, it actually presents the story backwards, reversing cause and effect. I call these the wet streets cause rain stories, papers full of them. In any <laughs> case, you read with yeah. exasperation or amusement the multiple errors in a story, and then you turn the page to national or international affairs and re read with renewed interest as if the rest of the newspaper was somehow more accurate about far off Palestine than it was about the story you just read. You turn the page yeah. and you forget what you know. That is the Gelman uh, amnesia effect as defined by Michael Crichton. And as you say, I think we can all understand that to some extent. Now, you being a media personality, me being a sort of media personality, we have had people write stories about us and I certainly don't recognize the person that these stories are written about. That's that's not right. me. That's totally, yeah. you've got everything wrong. That's um, right. But 
for the average person out there, I think everyone has experienced this. What, it, whatever it is that you're into, it, whether you're in a particular profession or an industry, or whether you're just a really big fan of something and you know more about it than the average person, when you read about, read some string reporter who just got assigned this as some sort of, you know, okay, uh, the editor's giving him this project and he'll write his thousand words and whatever, move on to the next thing. They're not going to get things accurate uh, as accurately as you would be able to with all of your knowledge and you right. see that you understand that and you can yes. understand that if you're being empathetic to that journalist at that point because yeah i mean it's just some string reporter you just got assigned this uh, he's not he's not an expert in this but exactly as craigan points out we forget when we're reading about something we don't know about, we assume that the person writing about it is an expert in it. <laughs> that is a bad assumption because, uh, well, anytime you look into it, it turns out not to be the case, right? It, well, in terms of being empathic about it, they have become evangelical and aggressive. So if you question what they're saying, they will attack and try to destroy and that is what is disgusting in the present moment. That is absolutely yeah. unacceptable. It needs to be stopped with aggressive, firm hand somehow. And uh, th this this can't go on. It just cannot go on. Uh, that's so exactly that's the part right. that, that I, it's one thing. Yeah. It's one thing for this to be about. Star Wars or something. You're a big Star Wars fan and someone writes yeah. some article and oh, they got it all right. wrong. Uh, okay, that's one thing. But when we're talking about true, world-changing, life-changing, incredibly important subjects that go to the heart of who we are as a society and what is happening in the world, and then we get gaslit by the same people who are telling us outright demonstrable lies that, no, you're crazy yes. and you're weird and you can't, uh, why do you believe these things? That is... That truly is galling, and I, I have to admit my empathy does run out at a certain point when, when suddenly uh, I'm being demonized for knowing more than the person who's writing about whatever subject they're writing about. I, I've stepped through kind of an interesting relationship with the press and media, and, and I'm wondering if it's, if it's being echoed in other, other folks. So I, I slowly I canceled the LA Times when they became like, absurd and wrote some terrible and lies about myself. So I was like, okay, that's done. Uh, I always loved reading the New York Times every morning. And then I saw them start to go south and I reluctantly had to stop New York Times. Then I, I literally stopped watching the news because it was, it was so full of uh, inaccuracies and excesses. So, so I've gone from a, a sort of avid consumer to somebody who used news or at least journalism as a as a thought mechanism to try to re understand things and think about things and i've in a stepwise fashion abandoned all of it i i now essentially everything comes from you social media independent sources it, it's just you cannot trust what is out there even and it's creating parallel economies because people are tired of being sold goods by companies that seem to hate them or disdain them. How do we understand this in the context of this historical sweep that you've been talking about, this being the Gutenberg Bible moment? Are we going to come up with solutions? Is this going to result in social discord as it did with the Gutenberg Bible? How, how are we going to do yeah. it? I mean, that's really the question, isn't it? For people who don't really understand the significance of Gutenberg, I mean, there's, uh, uh, we still really can't appreciate just how fundamentally that changed the course of human history and how much changed as a result of it. Uh, there's, I mean, the Reformation probably would not have been possible without the uh, the printing press and right. then uh, the, all sure. of the political sure. upheaval that came as a result of that. And so what we saw over the course of the pre preceding centuries was various attempts by various kings and tyrants and what have you to try to crack down on the printing press, because obviously this is a huge upheaval and upheaval is not good. If you are the, the tyrant or the dictator or the king, you want things to be at the status quo. So this technology is changing things. We have to clamp down on it. So that was what we saw, the ham-handed attempts to try to essentially censor the press. 
um, by fiat, um, that the kings, you, for example, in, in England, um, you, you had various laws that came in in the 17th century that you had to be licensed to run a printing press, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there were various ways that they tried to clamp down on it, but that didn't quite work. And obviously, I think, for example, in the American Revolution, um, it was the pamphleteers who truly changed the course of the American Revolution and, and got people to understand that they were going through a revolutionary moment. No, this isn't some civil war within the British Empire. We are in a revolution. And it was Thomas Paine and common sense completely, uh, utterly changed the American mindset. Um, and who just some some guy with just access to a printing press. So you can put the the cork on the bottle, but it's going to come off again. Um, but I think the 20th century, the consolidation of the the journalism enterprise into this industry, this multi billion dollar industry by these mega corporate institutions, that was an even more effective way, essentially, of not not controlling the press in the sense that you need a license in order to print something, but simply making it out of the reach of the average person so you have these editorial gatekeepers. And what we have seen over the past 20 years is that cork coming off because suddenly average people, people like me sitting in my room in Japan can suddenly start this podcast that's being heard by ultimately millions of people around the world. What on earth is going on? And uh, that is the <laughs> revolutionary side of this because what we saw 500 plus years ago with Gutenberg and the complete revolutionary change in society that took place, we are starting to see what that could look like in the current era. That's not necessarily always an unfettered good for everyone all the time and yay, happiness and Shangri-La, but at any rate, it does get us closer to actual communication and actual spreading of knowledge and ideas and actual discussion, which is anathema to the status quo. So we're starting to see the same types of things the kings of old did to try to clamp down on the printing press. We're starting to see the, the establishment rallying around clamping down on the internet and so now we get no things aren't true or false now we have misinformation and disinformation and malinformation and what is malinformation God. it is true information that is uh, upsetting to the status quo essentially that that makes the uh, the establishment unhappy and you have the actual department of Ho homeland security in the united states warming warning about malinformation as terrorism this is this is serious stuff, and I, I think the average person out there probably isn't taking it nearly as seriously as the people in positions of power are right now, and that's why we're hearing so much about this misinformation, disinformation, we have to crack down, because they understand just how revolutionary a moment this can be. And you point to the, the fundamental question of trust, yes. No doubt. I, I, I have seen it certainly in the work that I do, and even amongst the sort of the average general um, Joe out there in the public, I, I, I think the, the, the tr loss of trust in the media is palpable. Most people now mm. tend to distrust a lot of the establishment media outlets that they used to turn to. But I would hope that we don't simply fall into some sort of new trap of, okay, well, now who now who do I blindly put my trust in? I think the real point of the Gelman am amnesia effect is that we have to consciously remember that, oh yeah, whoever's writing this may not be an expert in what they're writing. Maybe they are an expert, maybe they're not. I have to verify that information that I choose to take on board. And I think that uh, yes. it's uncomfortable because that puts the onus back on us. Oh my God, it's work. I have to actually look things up. I have to actually but you know what? Um, I, sort I, things out for myself. I, but if we don't get I, ourselves in that mindset, we will never really break through the paradigm that's been established over the past century. So I have three kind of interesting reactions to that. One, one, what you just said. One is that it kind of reminds me of page, how patients behave should behave properly in the setting of navigating the medical system. They need to be informed, they need to be motivated, they need to be aware, and they need to have a trusted guide, an ombudsman that should be their primary caretaker or it can be a lot of different things, but you need, you need a person that you can trust and not that you follow them blindly, but that you help them. They help you make sense of the buzzing, blooming mess that's out there. Number two, it's interesting to me that uh, COVID was an example of the status quo, as you say, the people in power, the the elite, behaving like the kings of yore, uh, really uh, clamping down <laughs> and destroying people, bringing out the guillotines, everything. The, old, the playbook is all there. It just has a more modern sort of 
um, application or, or, you know, the way it's just so, I mean, really that that's very helpful to me actually to think about it that way. Cause it's the same old thing. And uh, I would argue back then you had an obligation not to cave to that. You also had an obligation not to, I would say, uh, if history is any teacher, to feed into the guillotines. Don't, don't, don't bring out the guillotines because everybody goes up eventually. It doesn't, doesn't sort anything out. As we see now, uh, we have guillotines now related to plagiarism. We had guillotines related to having an opinion about COVID. There's guillotines about everything. And it's, and it's still going. It's going to go for a while. And then finally, uh, we have to remember that not only was the Lutheran revol- you know, Martin Luther able to uh, play out his revolution because of the printing press, one of the fundamental, and people aren't aware of this particular fact, that one of the fundamental issues that resulted in the religious wars was that was what was fundamental to Martin Luther and Protestantism was that you should read your own Bible. And they were being printed at a very high rate so you could get access to a Bible. That's thus the Gutenberg Bible is such a sentinel phenomenon in, in, the, in this story. While the Catholics believe you needed the priest to interpret everything for you and the Bible is not the, not the domain of an average person. They should stay away from it. It's dangerous. Uh, am, I, am I stating any, does all that sort of, is that all that correct? I guess I'm asking. Yeah. It, there, there's a lot to get into there, but uh, one thing that I will point out yeah. is that the uh, the 95 theses that uh, Martin Luther famously <laughs> nailed to the church door that was uh, addressed to the Archbishop of Mainz, which is the city that Gutenberg was born in. So there's there's a lot of historical parallels going on in that story. But you're uh, you're exactly right. Uh, th- there has been some back and forth about well, how important was the printing press to what Luther was doing? But Luther himself said that uh, the uh, the printing press was the the, the father of the Reformation or whatever way he actually put it. Um, certainly so. the idea so. of an average priest in the middle of nowhere, like who's this guy, suddenly being able to have a st- start and ignite this conversation that ultimately upends a- an institution that's been around for more than a millennia and has such power, that that truly is a revolutionary moment. And I think we can all understand mm. what that looks like. And as you say, what we're experiencing now is essentially the same, if not the same thing, it's a very mark- markedly similar thing that is playing out in the modern application, in the modern context. So what are the kind of the same establishment institutions that are preparing to fall in the way that, say, the the, the Holy Roman Empire, the, whole, the Roman Catholic Church, how, uh, what is, the, what is the, the parallel going on today? Well, we can see this in the reflection. For example, something that would have been absolutely laughed at out of the room. You're absolutely insane, crazy for even bringing it up a few years ago that now people go, well, yes, of course that exists. Look at something like the World Economic Forum and their great reset. Yes, we're going to use this crisis of the pandemic as an opportunity a crisis if you will, to reset the earth and all public relations. And we're going to, we're, we're going to start these new institutions and establishments and all of this. I, I think what we're seeing is a, a combination of panic on the side of the people in the status quo who understand that the, uh, the, the populist movement, uh, political movement at any rate of the last several years is a true threat to their, their power and people's trust in those institutions, but also Unfortunately, along with that crisis moment comes the possibility, I think, for people who have an agenda to consolidate control and power to move that agenda forward. And everything, everything depends on the way that we react to this and the types of things that we do to either push this forward into that revolutionary phase or to simply acquiesce and, oh, oh, well, I guess I guess we'll just have to fall back in line and and make sure that we're doing what we're told. And, oh, I, I don't want to say any misinformation, so I better not say anything at all. And the more that we shut up and basically allow these tyrants to do what they're going to do, well, then it's game over. Then they win. Uh, that's I, I I was hoping to get your opinion. I think I got it, and uh, and I have a few more minutes with you before I wrap things up. Wh- what what is preoccupying you these days? What what are you concerned about? I am concerned about a lot of things that people can find on CorporateReport.com, but one that in particular for this year that I think is incredibly important and is not receiving enough attention is the World Health Organization's 
pandemic accord agreement whatever they're calling it this week they keep changing the name so that people can't find out what it means and what it is but essentially for people who don't know there's a couple of processes going on in the world health organization right now one is to reform the international health regulations to to put amendments forward on that another is to create a pandemic agreement that would essentially allow the world health organization director general to declare a public health emergency over pretty much anything he feels like at any time. And with that, to trigger a number of things that will essentially make the World Health Organization able to more effectively dictate what each and every individual member state's um, response to that emergency is. And we saw what happened in the past few years with regard to all of that. So I think that should be sending a shiver down the spine of everyone who's listening if they're paying attention. And that is coming to a head in May at the 75th World Health Assembly, 75th, 77th, whatever it is, um, the World Health Assembly in May in Geneva, they are going to try to push this through. And uh, this truly could be the the, the end of health sovereignty um, nationally, let alone individually. And I think people need to be paying attention to that. Oh, my gosh. We, we spoke to Michelle Bachman, who's trying to rattle the cage uh, at Congress and uh, getting very little traction. And it is, it is it, an astonishing document that will give them fiat authority over all sovereign elected officials that is that is, the the more consolidated the more centralized the worse the outcome in health for the individual it's just how healthcare works it needs to be it needs to be distributed where a person is taking care of a person that's why we have it that way it's why it's been that way you put everything in centralized authority untold harm gets done and uh, did we not just see that well, listen, I appreciate you spending some time with me. I hope you'll give me a chance to catch you again. I know it's it's hard in Japan, but uh, as things come up, I'd love to hear your thoughts about these things. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks for the time. CorbettReport.com. Check them out there. Uh, so we're going to have Jordan Schachtel in here in just a second. Uh, he's going to be talking about the House testimony today. Uh, there he is. It's There it is on the screen right now. Uh, let's just get uh, to uh, a couple of minutes uh, from those that support the show so we can do this thing, and then we'll be back with Jordan. Are you one of the millions of American women and men dealing with premature hair thinning and hair loss? Or maybe you're scared about inheriting that thinning look because it runs in your family? Start 2024 with a real solution that delivers results without the harsh side effects or unwanted chemicals and no need for prescription. Provia uses a safe natural ingredient, Procapil, to effectively target the three main causes of premature hair thinning and hair loss. Susan has been using Provia for months and she loves it. I'm so happy because Provia is helping me grow longer, stronger, and shinier hair, especially up on top. In fact, Provia was created by the founder of Genucel, the makers of our favorite skincare products, so it is no surprise that she has seen amazing results. Right now, new customers save over 50%, plus free shipping. Every introductory package includes a full 60-day supply of Provia serum for daily use, plus the Provia Super Concentrate for faster, more noticeable results. Don't wait. Order now to save an extra 10% and get free shipping at ProviaHair.com forward slash Drew. That's P-R-O-V-I-A-H-A-I-R, ProviaHair.com slash D-R-E-W. I think everyone knows the next medical crisis could be just around the corner, whether it comes in the form of another pandemic or something much more routine like a tick bite. You and your family need to be prepared. That's where the wellness company comes in. You know the wellness company. We have their physicians on like Dr. McCullough frequently. The wellness company and their doctors are medical professionals you can trust. And their new medical emergency kits are the gold standard when it comes to keeping you safe and healthy. It's really, it's a safety net. It's an insurance policy that you hope you're not going to need. But if you need it, you sure as heck are going to wish you had it if you need it. Be ready for anything. This medical emergency kit contains an assortment of life-saving medications, including ivermectin, z pack The medical emergency kit provides a guidebook to aid in the safe use of all these life-saving medications. From anthrax to tick bites to COVID-19, the wellness company's medical emergency kit is exactly what you need to have on hand to be prepared. Rest assured, knowing that you have emergency antibiotics, antivirals, and antiparasitics on hand to help you and your family stay safe from whatever life throws at you next. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC. That is D-R-D-R-E-W dot com forward slash T-W-C to get 10% off today. Just click on that link. Ladies and gentlemen, let's make a resolution that's easy to keep and delivers immediately on its promise. 
With GenuCell Skin Care, you can turn back the clock and look 5, 10, even 15 years younger. And right now, GenuCell Skin Care is celebrating 2024 with its New Year's sales event. Save over 60% off all of our favorite GenuCell products with one of our customized skin care routine packages. Say goodbye to those fine lines in the forehead and run your corner of your eyes. Sagging jawline, dark marks, skin redness, even under eye bags. Leave them in 2023. GenuCell works for women and men. It's safe for all skin types and perfect for skin of any age. Plus, with its immediate effects, GenuCell promises results that will make you smile. Guaranteed or 100% of your money back. Start your new year look off right with one of our custom GenuCell skincare bundles right now at GenuCell.com slash Drew. Use our special code Drew at checkout for extra savings off your order today. And remember, every order place is automatically upgraded to free shipping. Don't wait. That is genucel.com forward slash Drew, G E N U C E L dot com slash D R E W. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate you all being here. Uh, poor Caleb's trying to communicate me while I'm interacting on the restream. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Pulled out my earpieces in order to concentrate. Uh, is Jordan available? Oh, yes. He's here. Is he here yet? Okay, so let's bring Jordan right in. Uh, Jordan, of course, is another independent investigative journalist. Uh, he is the publisher of The Dossier on Substack, dossier.substack.com. Follow him at, on X, uh, Jordan Schachtel. Jordan, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? I always worry that I'm not. Yeah, you nailed it. Perfect. Okay. All right. It's S-C-H-A-C-T. Get again, Jordan, S-C-H-A-C-H-T-E-L. That's where he is on X. So uh, I wanted to hear your thoughts on the testimony, I guess it was yesterday with Dr. Fauci and the subcommittee on the coronavirus. I, I thought it was odd for me that I was searching around for stuff and I didn't see too much other than a lot of denials and I don't know and I don't remember. Uh, is that mostly what happened? Yeah, that's essentially what happened. O over 100 instances of Fauci um, not remembering, which is someone who's trained by, you know, four different lawyers. This is what he's been instructed to say. Um, so no surprise there. It's not really, unfortunately, you know, it gives us evidence of nothing because if he was culpable in something or not, he would say the same thing in order not to, you know, he feels that they're his lawyers probably feel that there's some type of partisan attack on him. And in order to not perhaps incriminate himself, he's just going to say, you know, he's going to err on the side of caution and say he doesn't know. What I found interesting was that not only does he have two private lawyers, but he has two government, aka taxpayer funded lawyers. And I'm trying to figure out why that is, because this is a man who supposedly retired um, at the end of 2022. So he's been uh, apparently a private citizen for over a year, but nonetheless, um, I'm not sure if your your viewers and, and uh, listeners are aware of this, but Fauci has um, full time private security that is um, <laughs> funded by the U.S. taxpayer as well. The U.S. Marshal Service um, has a chauffeur who drives him around, who drives him around wherever he goes. And he also has a security team that follows him around in two, you know, or two or three or four, uh, you know, big suburbans. So. It, it, it's very strange, you know, th th there's there's no um, uh, you know, transparency at all in the Biden administration. This is a guy who's supposed to be off the payroll, and yet he has all of these, you know, endless government services. And yet you have a guy like RFK Jr., who's, you know, t some in some polls, 20 percent running a third party uh, as, as an independent, and he can't get Secret Service protection. So it's just very strange where the priorities lie. Um, but if you want to go back to Fauci, uh, the new thing now is that um, I think that a lot of the Republicans in Congress are also culpable in what happened with, um, you know, endorsing multiple rounds of, you know, these these injections that were, you know, there was really no proof that they were, you know, life saving cures for 25 year olds. Yet they claimed that and, you know, many even endorsed shots for the kids. Um, so they really want to sweep this under the rug. You know, they want to make Fauci their boogeyman. They want to distract people. Um, but, you know, they're also culpable. So they're just, you know, there's this new narrative that's emerging, basically that's saying that Fauci didn't really know about the 
the funding that was going on through his agency, although he signed off on it. Like, imagine if a CEO of a company had signed off on illegal activity. Um, you think the feds wouldn't go after him? But that's that's an aside. Like, I think the whole thing, unfortunately, is an unserious investigation. You know, they don't plan on you know pushing forward any prosecutions. Um, I, I hope that I would be pleasantly surprised and proven wrong, but I don't think that's the case. Well, I... I thought, I mean, I interviewed Rand Paul and I was following his uh, social media for the days leading up to the interview. And he seemed to be doing a lot of prep work. He seemed very intent on really getting to the bottom of things. Was he cut off in some way? Rand Paul is one of the few guys that is uh, taking this thing seriously. So my comments are not at all directed towards him. But, you know, the the Republican establishment um that was telling people to double mask and get a booster and, you know, shoot up their kids with uh, experimental uh, genetic serums that those are the people that I think that want this issue to go away as soon as possible. You know, the people like Rand Paul, Thomas Massey and the like, they're heroes of this past era. But I, I don't think that the majority of Republicans uh, will ever agree with them or you know hold themselves accountable for what they did. Well, if indeed that's their motivation, uh, why why do they not object to what the CDC is doing in terms of doubling down on their Im imperatives for vaccinating children and young people? Wh why not somebody raise their hand and go, two things, by the way, two things. A, uh, this is a much milder illness, not clear that the risk is worth the benefit. Just a simple question like that. And B, oh, by the way, there's been excess deaths since the pandemic. How about we look into that? I, I, mm -hmm. I can't imagine those two things do not get raised uh, in going forward. I just can't even like, I can't get my head around. At least, at least some country will do that, if not us. I hope so. I mean, you know, the, the U.S. Um, big health organizations were extremely radical in the promotion of specifically uh, so-called vaccines for children, COVID vaccines for children. This was like, and, and babies and infants, it was it was unprecedented really throughout the world. So um, we really put ourselves in, you know, the, the, the furthest of the extremes in endorsing it, mm -hmm. you know, in our legislators mm -hmm. and our, our presidents endorsing this, this madness. So I think a lot of people got caught up in that and it's very difficult to get them to actually investigate themselves really <laughs> Um, so I, I, you know, the, we see all this crazy guidance from the CDC that they're still, you know, posting on, uh, X and Instagram and all this. And yeah, you don't really see, um, our elected officials pushing back. In fact, you know, most of them, a lot of them were just reelected last year. So, um, <laughs> it doesn't seem like, you know, when, when so many people are caught up by this hysteria, and I think it was the vast majority of the country that got this horribly wrong and their legislators represent them, nobody really wants to talk yeah. about it anymore. And, you know, I, I admire the fact that you're you're sticking to this and really looking out for the people who were both physically and, you know, emotionally and psychologically harmed by this era. You know, there needs to be accountability. So, you know, I appreciate what you're doing on this front. Well, well to be careful of my position, I, accountability is a, a rough term. Uh, I, I want to get to the bottom. I want to understand what we're doing and I want to understand where we made mistakes. I want to understand I, I, so we don't make those mistakes again. I, I, I think by too overly focusing, and my, my audience isn't going to like this, overly focusing on uh, Nuremberg 2.0 and all this stuff, of course, if you start threatening people with their, their, their liberty, like they're going to be imprisoned or harmed in some way by the virtue, just by virtue of looking into this, they're going to fight like maniacs against looking into things or getting to the bottom. I just want to get to the bottom. So it seems to me we need everybody in on this and give her, give people a pass for making a mistake. There was a hysteria. I, I don't care. Let's, though, get to the bottom of this and let's not let it happen again. And it might mean sort of legislative interventions against it, it, on the other side of this, it, it empowers people not to listen to the bullshit on misinformation and malinformation and disinformation. I think that should be the target, not the people that led us astray. 
but the fact that they are still trying to silence people for having an opinion. That's the, that's the real problem in all this. Not, in my opinion, you know, putting people in prison for mistakes. They, I, I don't have any interest in that. I'd like to get to the bottom of it, and then I'd like to address the people that continue to slander people if they have an opinion. That should, that should be done asunder in some way. I agree with you on that front, but I think that there also needs to be, I think at least we need to remember forever what these people did. They they committed yes. horrific yes. Uh, human rights, you know, crimes against yes. the entire citizenry of the United States. They, they locked us yes. down without due process. Um, I don't know if it was a fomented hysteria or, you know, just a naturally occurring hysteria. I guess we can still continue to investigate that. But what these lawmakers and bureaucrats did um they I, I think that there's there's some lines that were crossed that are unforgivable and you know remove them from any kind of uh you know in, in a civil polite society they should not still be in positions of power so i think that's the grievance that a lot of americans i think who agree with me have with you know what's going on in washington dc that there's just this amazing lack of accountability and we have to remember that you know, these people did horrific things, whether it was the corporate media um, acting as the enforcers yep. of, you know, the CDC, yep. the WHO, uh, the FDA, the, these corrupt pharmaceutical organizations. I mean, they committed horrific crimes against people, you know, compelling um, all of our armed service members to take this shot that resulted in a lot of sickness and injury. Um, an un unnecessary, totally, entirely unnecessary shot for people, you know, in the prime of their lives. So th there's just so many, so many factors here where these people haven't been held accountable at all. So um, I, I know that it's, you know, it's kind of out there, but I think that a lot of people are just expressing their righteous anger and frustration with what happened that, you know, for those of us, there were, there were, it was a minority of us who I think saw this picture very clearly um in 2020 and 2021 when you know the city of new york was forcing unvaccinated people to eat outside in the middle of the winter or when you know california's governor was you know bulldozing um you know outdoor facilities or when they were you know taking the hoops off of basketball courts or or when the you know the the administration of harvard was firing all employees who refused to get boosted um, that they were basically just creating this this class of, you know, lesser people, those who did not accommodate the demands of the regime. And, and none of it, we know that none of it was about our health. Um, and that was, that's the most disturbing part that like, you know, this, they were, whether it was Pfizer gaming these studies to make a massive profit or the Biden administration using it, um, you know, using immigration policy, as a weapon, you know, prior to this crazy border madness, they were basically blocking out um, <laughs> people from entering the country unless it was uh, Mexicans crossing the border and they didn't need, um, you know, any type of vaccine certificate. So it was just like this bizarre discriminatory time in our lives. Um, and I and I wish, uh, you know, I agree with you. I wish we had the answers on accountability. But at, at the very least, you know, we need to keep talking about this stuff because, what they did is so unforgivable. It's so against, you know, every semblance of what it means to be an American and, you know, protect and defend um, our, our rights and, and our, you know, our founding uh, liberties that are supposed to be, you know, enshrined upon us by, uh, you know, the sovereign uh, deity. These rights were historically violated. And, you know, I, I just... Unfortunately, I don't believe that the people in power are ever going to hold themselves accountable for it. And I don't disagree really with anything you just said. Maybe a couple of nuances I would disagree with, but <laughs> a couple of things. I, I'm seeing I'm seeing stuff fly around these days where people are starting to push back on the pushback by saying we should have had more lockdown. We should have been more like China. Uh, California governor didn't go long enough, which I just can't even believe those words are spoken. They they need to be mocked when people say you need to make fun of people for being so detached from reality. Just you should you should not let them get away with that. So my first my first uh, uh, policy is mocking, 
mock the hell out of them for their insane ideas, number one. Uh, but number two, and to your back to your accountability thing, I, I do think that the courts are the answer for this stuff in the sense that, you know, if you were in the military or you were forced to get a vaccine to go to school and you were injured, you should sue the hell out of those institutions. And that, that will get heard. I, I'm not sure that anything else will. And it seems like there should be a lot of that one of these days soon. Yeah, I, I just read a report about a multi-million dollar successful lawsuit against the university. So that was definitely encouraging. But I totally agree with you. Like the people that are, um, the people that say we should have locked down harder, the Fauci's of the world, you know, I, either mentally ill or perhaps both that and <laughs> so power hungry that they are a, a danger to every single person around them. Don't ever give them power ever again. Please do not do that. <laughs> I but, agree uh, with you. you know, I agree. And, and these, however, these, however, the, it, there, there's one thing, there's one little wrinkle in my head. When I sit there and I try to think, what is wrong? What is there something wrong with me? What am I not seeing here? Is is there some what is wrong with him for saying stuff like that? How could how could it be so far off? And then you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that he has these government uh, lawyers uh, and between the government uh, appointed lawyers and this uh, bizarre, unthinkable relation to what, how we should be responding to this virus, both make me worry that there is some sort of classified something that we don't know that he's worried about that would explain some of the insane excesses and also explain why he has all these lawyers that are from the government that he may be able to talk about classified material with them and no one else yeah it was an interesting strategy that the republicans decided to do this behind closed doors i was still hoping because you know i've already given up on accountability i was hoping for one more series of uh you know rand paul and fauci back and forths um yes that, that was some epic nice. uh content and i appreciate <clears throat> him having his feet held to the fire very publicly uh anthony fauci for his entire you know 80 something years of life has surrounded himself with yes men who you know just throw themselves all over him in order to either get grants or to you know get some type of product moved somewhere or to get um, you know some type of um, employment in the government uh, the man the man is a total joke and i i think that you know in order for our country to heal he needs to be made into a public laughing stock and i think a lot of the country now sees that that he absolutely is it's such a shame he he was so helpful during uh hiv i know that uh, rfk jr does not feel that way but uh, i was there i lived through that whole thing i was deep in it uh, serving patients and it was he was helpful and as compared to the present moment, I mean, I, trust me, it's totally different. His behavior was so shocking. I kept hoping, I kept saying it publicly, I, I hope it reverts to the mean where, where, where the old, the guy I knew before com comes out. Never, he never showed up. He never showed well, up. As you are uh, probably it's aware, what makes me, you know, when you give people power, everyone reacts in a different way. And you don't really know how they'll react until they're delivered with a heaping scoop of power. And then you kind of see what they do with it. With Fauci, it was the worst possible thing to put him on the cover of every magazine in America. You know, he basically ended up uh, giving up his faith because he considers himself a god now. So it was, it was just, it was crazy what happened. You couldn't empower a, a more um, unqualified person for that moment. What do you have to say about my classified theory or the, some something happening that we, they, they're not telling us that would make, start to make sense of his crazy behavior? Is that just a completely uh, untenable theory? No, I think there's something to that. Um, in, in my view, I'm undecided about whether a you know, genetically modified virus is the culprit or whether this is more of just a hysteria that was the culprit i lean heavily on the hysteria i guess it could be bold mm -hmm. but i think that you know mm -hmm. when you read these emails at least the redacted emails you find that there was re a real sense of panic um in the top yeah. levels of the yeah. nih and the niaid yeah. and, and fauci's agency and i think that maybe they did yeah. like my theory is that maybe they did believe that they had unleashed a virus um and that it was a killer virus but of course you know the statistics don't bear that out thanks to you know we have the work of like John Ioannidis and, you know, 
countless additional you know, great scientists. Um, but I think that it was possible that they they totally freaked out and they engaged in some type of they did engage in a cover up. That's what the emails show, in my opinion. Um, so, you know, that's entirely legitimate. But I don't think that they actually unleashed a killer virus because there was there was no killer virus. So um, it, it, it's it, it, I still find it very interesting to uh, you know think about that. Well, back to your uh, original uh, sort of observance about their behavior, it, it it was absolutely hysterical. It was excessive, and it trampled on sacred privileges. And the fact that we are still in a situation where it, it just, why couldn't it happen again? In fact, the World Health Organization would like to be the organization delivering the, 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 the uh, boot on the neck of your uh, civil liberties. And what do you suggest we do? I, I, you know, it, this time really challenged the, the 2020 to 2023, challenged the way I think about how humans react to mass hysterias. I mean, I was living in Washington, D.C. when this first started, and I was going just, you know, for runs outside. People were yelling at me to put a mask on, and I never thought in my life that, that yeah. anything like that would ever happen. So I wish I had yeah. some type of solution to make sure that this thing doesn't happen again i guess we can just try to build awareness that there's a lot of bad people out there that are easily fooled by the corporate media and all these lunatics in government and when they decide to label someone as an enemy you know they really mean it and some of these people might you know take act take all these crazy action again against them so i think the solution is you know a more distributed media and channels like this um, we need to hold yeah. our government officials accountable for what they did. And, you know, we, we just need to find a way to preserve um, our liberties, essentially. I, I want you to sit and think for a second. I've got to remind somebody, I'm going to have to um, talk about some friends of ours that are supplying the CBD distillery to us. But uh, while, while I am uh, sort of uh, telling people about this, uh, the group, I want to come back afterwards and, and think and talk about the hysteria part that to me was so fascinating. And yet it sort of drove me back into history to look at events that I thought humans just didn't do anymore. It turns out we do and we do them without exception and we do them and do them and do them regardless of the technologies or the level of intellectual training people have of a given day. So I want to get your more of your thoughts on mass formation the the idea that humans go, go in and maybe now the fact that we have all these technologies make it worse because it can sort of be fomented in such an effective way and spread all right i want to remind people about cb distilleries perhaps you're sleeping you hurt a bit or you're stressed out cbd something you could consider i've used it for patients in the past cb distillery cb distilleries target formulations are made from the highest quality clean ingredients no fluff no fillers just pure effective cbd Solutions are designed to help. In two non-clinical surveys, 81% of customers experienced more calm. 80% said CBD helped with pain, uh, particularly after physical activity. And an impressive 90% said they slept better with CBD. Results, of course, will vary, but I have recommended to patients to use CBD both topically and orally for pain, for sleep, and sometimes I'm very impressed. So if you struggle with concerns and haven't found relief, consider CB Distillery, over 2 million customers, and, and a solid 100% money-back guarantee. CB Distillery is the source to trust. I have a 20% discount to get you started. Visit CB distillery.com and use the code drew dairy w for 20 percent off that is cb distillery.com code drew one more time cb distillery.com all right let's get back to jordan Schachtel. so i i'm just you know sort of curious in your private moments when you think about these hysterias like wh what's wrong with us that we didn't get I, that, that's another way of sort of looking at it like what's wrong with me that i didn't get swept into the hysteria we seem to be the abnormal ones is there something wrong with us or, or maybe there was reason to be hysterical or maybe the hysteria is something of a survival mechanism that's in us not sort of a dysfunctional uh sort of feature of so society what, what are your private thoughts on this it's tough to do a uh, you know self analysis. I've always been a little bit of a weirdo, <laughs> so it, it was perfect. It was a perfect moment. It was my shining moment. But um, in all seriousness, uh, I don't know. Like it is it, just it was so shocking to me 
um, you know, you read about these atrocities in history and now that do they, can they happen Yes. in Rwanda, Cambodia, Germany, all these places, um, yeah. where, you know, those were mass slaughters, but this was, you know, mass antagonistic behavior. I think mass formation psychosis is what Dr. Robert Malone calls it. And I don't know if that is his theory, but he's, uh, been, you know, putting it back out in the press. It, it, it's an interesting question, you know, that um, sometimes we think of ourselves as, I guess, very far removed from the animal kingdom, when in truth, we are, re- we are, have the ca- capacity to think rationally. But in this era, and it's an interesting question, where we have all this information at our fingertips, um, sometimes people still act like savages, um, unintelligent or just, you know, not thoughtful. There's, a, there's like interesting studies about independent thought and actually how difficult it is to think independently because all the incentives structure in our civilization is just kind of to go along with the crowds. You don't really want to stand out. It's, it's actually very unusual mm. for people to stand out. I guess like that's in kind of, mm. uh, it, 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 so I, you know, you put all these pieces together and, and you could start to kind of paint a picture of how things could possibly go very wrong. Um, but let's hope it doesn't happen. At least, you know, give us until 2030, give us a little bit of a break before the next <laughs> mass hysteria. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's uh, Desmond, Desmond Matias uh, was studying mass formation long before this particular mass formation. And he announced that here it is. Uh, Malone is the one that added psychosis to the term uh, mass formation. And he's not wrong. It would look delusional to me. I, I, I think that's what it was. But it, as we talk about these things, I'm, I'm having a memory that I shall never forget. I actually went to get the vaccine from the hospital where I'd been attending for 40 years, nearly half a century we're closing in on here. And uh, was, did my training there and taught there and was not let in first uh, by a security guard who was standing through across a window, sort of making signs at me like I, I didn't know what he wanted or needed. Finally, he let me in and he started screaming at me, where are your papers? Where are your papers? Screaming, the 27-year-old screaming at a six-year-old attending that had been a leader there for decades. Where are your papers? Screaming. And I thought, oh, wow. I always wondered how this happened to people, how people became prison guards and how, how it's possible for that to happen. I, I witnessed it. I saw it happen right there, right in front of my eyes. I thought, here it is. Here it is. This, this is how it happens. People are in a hysteria. They believe. And again, always in the name of good, everybody. This is the part that cannot be forgotten. They're doing good. They're going to save people from the evil virus and, and bad people that spread the virus. Unvaccinated. Mind you, I was coming to get the vaccine. Where are your papers? Screaming. I couldn't get my, I didn't have the right papers, it turned out. Couldn't get the vaccine. Probably a good thing. Had to run around the hospital to all the medical staff offices. Two days later, I got COVID. So undoubtedly, I got picked it up in the hospital there running around uh, w- because I didn't have my papers. So give me a f- fucking break, everybody. This is what hysteria does. This is what we, you got to check yourself. That guy should do a deep dive on his behavior. Everybody who did anything like that, you should do a deep, everybody. Uh, look, we all made mistakes the whole way through the pandemic and we all, I'm sure, did stuff that we are not particularly proud of. Look at it, look at it hard, and don't do that next time. Don't cave into this stuff. Couldn't agree more. You know, everyone wants to be, everyone says they would have been that German citizen in 1937 who was disgusted and appalled by the Nazi party's behavior. But, you know, most people either joined in or cowered away. So, you know, there's a lesson there. And, like, you know, even with your example of people that literally have to say, papers, please, they they think they're doing it for a good reason, so they need they yes, need education. Yes, they always. definitely need education. That there are some principles <laughs> that once you cross the line, like there's no way you're the good guy. There, it's just there's just no chance. The the people that have done silencing of speech throughout certainly American history have never been the good guys. So if you are trying to silence speech, explain to me how you're the good guy or how you're different. 
than the previous excesses of those who have trampled on our civil liberties and privileges. Jordan, always good to talk to you. Uh, I guess you're a weirdo, which is why you were able to see things differently. I love the fact, I guess I'm a weirdo too, and, and that's <laughs> it really by definition we are because we saw this thing a little bit for what it was uh, early on. I had a similar experience running outside where I was running, I, and I was very... Um, very deferential to people. And the, and I, I, I went along with things more than I knew I should, but I did it just to be a nice guy. And I ended up, I was running uh, and I ran into the street because there was an old man with a mask on, you know, walking up the um, sidewalk. And as I ran by without a mask, he, I was probably eight feet away from him. He jumped away from me like I was on fire. I'll never, that's another thing I'll never forget from the pandemic. Like, what did we do to that poor guy? Everybody, if air is moving, this virus, COVID does not transmit. It's, that's it, period. So outdoor transmission is exceedingly uncommon, if not ne um, approaching never. So don't, don't, if you're wearing a mask outside, we've done something to you. And uh, I just feel sorry. For, and these days, I feel sorry for those people. Yeah, it was crazy. I, I have so many stories from my time in D.C., and then when I was freed uh, to the to the free state of Florida, freed. I didn't have any other incident. <laughs> but um, there was this one other time where wow. this this story is probably even crazier. Where I was going to my right. apartment gym in Arlington, Virginia, and this um, this um, overweight couple walks in. You know, both masks to the nines, and they, of course. you know, I'm working out like I'm I'm just minding my business. And then his wife gets really upset with me because, you know, this is like peak COVID hysteria. And the guy's like, uh, the guy walks over to me. He's like, will you, he was asking me if I, you know, if I was willing to wear a mask. And, you know, I'm thinking for a bit, I've always been a guy, you know, I'm a very diplomatic person. But that was like the first time where I realized that like there was no more, I was no longer welcome in the, in the city. So I, I said, no, I was like, I'm not going to do that. And, you know, if you have a problem with that, you can leave. Like, I was just like so fed up because we were in such a small minority group surrounded by all these crazies. And they're looking at us like we're crazy. And of course, history should have uh -oh. proved us correct. But it was just, you know, so many incidents like that um, where everything went just so nuts. And for those of us, and I'm sure there are many of you that are watching, listening, who had similar experiences, like we don't want this to be swept under the rug. So it, again, like it goes no. back to this Fauci hearing and, the, and it's just like, you know, it, it's deeply upsetting that there's just no accountability. And for people who went along, I don't think that they share our perspective because for them, they're like, oh, you know, I, it was like a weird time and everyone was doing this. And like, we were all just like being mm -hmm. weird. But like for us, we were just being viciously attacked online and in person and uh, you know, depending on where you live, maybe that wasn't the case. You know, if you lived kind of, um, say, in a in a more accommodating area, but for those of us who were in blue states, especially at the beginning, like it was just it was just so insane. Like it, it's hard to even like you think about those times and like, wow, that really that really happened. Like over a span of like a year yeah. and a half, just constant yeah. craziness, relentless craziness. Like yeah. Having, and and hey, boy, the fact that it was the blue states, I always thought these were the folks most concerned with civil liberties. That 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 is that right. was shocking to me. And then and then no sympathy for the trampling on civil liberties. Yeah, well, uh, you know, the modern Democratic Party. I have a lot of thoughts on that, but they've become really you know, the, the you know the Republican yeah. Party isn't great either. But you know, the Democratic Party is in a weird place where they have transformed from the you know the party uh, that fought against vietnam to the the party that's for all the wars and all of you know the corporate it's interests weird. in america and, for you know, they, for they, the fbi for <laughs> the for the uh you know the investigative state for trampling on civil liberties for stamping out misinformation or anybody that dares to uh, address the elite or, and their and their narratives I, that is this is wild again people look at yourself if that's you look at yourself it, it's it's a, it's that that's the that's the current hysteria it's it's a low level mass formation that where they can't see how much they've changed their values 
Uh, and it's it's not good. It is not good. All right, Jordan, I'm, I'm going to kind of wrap things up. Uh, maybe we'll have a deeper dive into that particular topic next time, all right? Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. All right, you got it. The dossier is uh, the Substack. Substack, whoop, dossier.substack.com. Uh, Susan, I know you're uh, busy with the Rumble Ranchers over there. And uh, what's happening? Everything uh, that we give, gave Susan a microphone I'm, too and a camera. So no, the camera no here. camera. I don't okay. have a camera today. Right. Um, I'm trying to get the link for our new sponsor. And CBdistillery.com. Yeah, but I thought it was Drew.CBdistillery. No, no, no that's CB not there. CBdistillery.com. Code Drew at checkout. Okay, use the code Drew at yeah. cbdistillery.com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I was go I was googling it because it somehow on the iPad it looked like Drew dot oh Code Drew. I see. That's the end of a sentence. Code Drew. Period. That's Once code cbdistillery.com. Cb cb code Drew. Yeah. Okay, so if you use CBD, head on over there and support the Rumble people because they're helping us out over there. So let's look at the uh, upcoming guests one more time. I think it's Rob Schneider tomorrow, if I'm correct on that. Uh, and there we go. This new mic is weird. It's good. It sounds good. I like it. Uh, Caleb, I'm going to put the, the upcoming guest up there real quick. Do you have that or did I bum rush you with that one? There they are. Uh, Paul Alexander on Thursday. Uh, Michael Nils uh, on the following Tuesday. Peter McCullough on Wednesday. Steve Van Fleet, Ed Dow, lots of really interesting guests coming. So again, we're, we are uh, open to uh, suggestions. If you guys want me to interview people, I'll be happy to do so. If there are things about the show that you like, don't like, contact at drdrew.com. She's sitting right Roseanne there. Roseanne had to reschedule. Yeah, yeah, Roseanne had to reschedule. Oh, she, went she, to, wanna, she went to the Iowa caucus. There's a lot, there's, let me just address this very quickly. There's a lot of weird shit going on uh, because of uh, Dr. Drew After Dark over at your mom's house. Look, stop it. I, I have nothing but uh, affection for everybody over there. It was a gift. That show was unexpected. Susan and Tom invented it out of whole cloth. There was a gift that went on for about five years. And Christina. Well, really, it was you and Tom, but Christina sat in at dinner with us that one night. Uh, and then Christina jumped in and helped the show uh, really a long, great deal right in the middle of its run. And then it wasn't supporting Well, then they anymore. moved to Austin. It just, things are... Yeah, it just, like, it, it was time. It was a great experience. I'm, I'll go back and do cameos over there. I'm communicating with everybody over there on a regular basis. Uh, you will no doubt see me over there again. And if they want to start it up again, or we might start it up here, we'll, we'll, we're looking at things. There's, we've got other ideas. There's some love line stuff uh, percolating around. I was talking to Adam about that this morning. So there's things to be done, but uh, stop it with all the negativity on your mom's house. Your mom's house. Stop I it, don't, stop they're it. not, well, they're not really negative. They're, they've been really nice. But they're just, everybody's nice just us. questioning okay. why, well, what happened, whose normal, fault was it, what it's happened? It's the normal course of things. I don't have, my cancer's not back. I wasn't, uh, I didn't storm out because some criteria, it, it was the end of a contract and we were yeah. looking at things and there was just no way to keep it keep it going. That that was that. So didn't pencil in. It didn't pencil. It's exactly right. And it was a lot of travel, a lot of work and I enjoyed every minute of it. But I will And they, guys. they worked so hard on that show. They put so much... Blood, oh, sweat, and tears into that show. That's the other thing. Those guys do super high quality stuff. They have a, an army of people was there doing the editing, doing the social media, and that gets expensive. And the show's got to support itself in order to do that. So there we are. Yep. All right, everybody. Uh, well, we'll be back Drew. tomorrow, three o'clock Pacific. What? Oh, yes. Oh, real, right. real quick, because I was just curious about this. I uh, on YouTube, I posted a poll because of the conversation that we were on, I was curious about what the audience was thinking about. I was offered them okay. two different choices. First choice is okay. Dr. Fauci goes to prison, but the truth about COVID is sealed for a hundred years or vice versa. The entire truth about COVID is made public, but nobody ends up being punished. Now, this is the interesting thing. Okay, is that, don't, don't, don't tell me the answer yet. I, I, oh, don't yeah, tell yes. me the answer. I, I would vote for the, se the latter, the second. That is my vote. Susan, what's your vote? You want to see him go to prison? We don't find out what happened, or we we move on. We don't. Punish I'm him, apolitical. But... I don't vote. Okay, she didn't vote. She uh, didn't vote. So, how did the audience? Look at I this. Feel the audience wanted, wanted it's some almost uh, blood. It was close to 50-50 before I brought attention to it. So it's oh, about 40-60. 63% of the people that are watching on YouTube would prefer the truth to be released, even if nobody ends up being punished. 35% still want to see Fauci in jail, even if we don't know the full truth. So it's it's a it's an interesting well, split there. I thought it was going to lean way more to Fauci being jailed, but a lot of people too. are a bit more I rational. I did too, but 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 
that, that 60% is, is my, it's almost 70%, guys. It's yeah, it's growing. Right now, yeah. And uh, that's a significant majority. And uh, I will get, continue to fight for the truth on your behalf. Let it be known. We're going to keep at it. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. My understanding is when you look at the data is that a lot of women will not even contemplate a guy like under 5'10". So you're, you're <laughs> the, the, apparently statistically know, that's true. So you're ruling out a whole bunch of guys so that might be- So then they have to be funny. <laughs> Like your your personality has to make up for that height. It could be great. Yeah, but like you're Mark not, Norman. But you're. I love the way you're just shitting on Mark Norman. I love but, Mark but, Norman, but, but he's short. Yes, and he even said that about himself. He was like talking about sh shit on himself, how short he was. But he's fucking hilarious. Hilarious. <laughs> <laughs>